Hey, what's going on? This is Rad, your host for Soft Rep Radio, and I have a special guest today. I have Peter Schinkel. Now, Peter has written a book um, kind of talking about you know, what happened in about 60 to 80 years ago with the New Deal and uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and uh, you know, bipartisanship, and he's written a book extensively about that. And we're going to talk to him about the past repeating itself today or what he thinks go is going on based off of his knowledge of, you know, the New Deal. So, Peter, welcome to Soft Rep Radio. Great to be here, Red. Thanks very much for having me. Now, will you tell me the name of... Yeah, tell me the name of your book. The name of the book is Uniting America. How FDR and Henry Stimson brought Democrats and Republicans together to together to win World War II, just as you've mentioned. And that's the book, and I'm very excited to talk to you about it today. Well, I would like to just dive into this. Uh, you know, we hear about today's um, uh, politics, that there's a new deal being out there, you know, and we hear about people talking about the new deal being brought back up today. Is this being based off of kind of like the new deal of the old days with uh, FDR and Henry Stimson, where they're trying to bring bipartisanship together and, you know, have this unity of, you know, the House, the Senate, the Congress, everybody, all the different executive levels of branches? You know, it's really interesting. Um, in today's world, we tend to think of bipartisanship taking place mostly in Congress when members of the two parties vote together. Um, what happened in 1940 was that President Franklin Roosevelt, who was, of course, a Democrat, appointed two very prominent Republicans to his cabinet. And so they were in the executive branch. And um, they worked together as a team, FDR, Henry Stimson, and Frank Knox, who was Secretary of Navy, um, for five years to bring the country together and win the war. Um, they also worked across and built bipartisanship in Congress, but the real center of this bipartisan alliance was in the executive branch, mm -hmm. which is somewhat un unusual. Uh, it's actually very unusual. Um, I mean, we have had bipartisan appointments throughout the subsequent decades. There have been uh, members of the opposing party appointed in various administrations. Uh, President Trump did none. President Biden has done none. Um, but um, by and large, uh, bipartisanship for, for the last 80 years has been in the executive branch, excuse me, in the um, legislative branch, in Congress. Uh -huh. But this was a very unusual arrangement, uh, and it led to remarkable success for the country and for the world, defending democracy against fascism. And um, I wrote this book because I believe it, it provides an incredible example of how Americans can come together, can reach across the political divide, can have thoughtful debates and have long debates and arguments and, and f fierce disputes and still come out the other side um, reaching uh, agreement and finding a way forward that is the best for democracy and for the country. So what you're saying is we can come together for a common goal and then achieve it. <laughs> if we could come together. Exactly. Shocking, isn't it? <laughs> that would be an amazing uh, thing to happen, you know, if everybody can just kind of set down uh, the flagpoles and just look at what the real goal is here and just, uh, you know, get it between the uprights. Okay, let's just kick it right through, right? Laces out. I don't know whatever analogy we got to use, but, you know, let's just all come together. Uh, you know, I, I don't have a problem. Like, let's say President Biden wanted to bring somebody who was a Republican, who was a war chief, like, you know, Franklin FDR did when he brought in um, the Secretary of uh, Defense, I think, or War, and made him the Secretary of War, who was a Republican, to help him. And to bring in, like, hey, I'm working with the president. He's a Democrat. I'm a Republican. And we're, we're, we're fighting fascism together. Exactly right. And what's interesting um, is that um, President Biden, of course, is a huge fan of FDR. And he has preached bipartisanship, the benefits of bipartisanship, and he's called for unity. So he's interested in this, very interested in achieving this goal. But he hasn't taken the step that FDR did, which was to appoint a Republican sure. to important positions in his cabinet. And 
on that, I'll just note that the Secretary of War, uh, a position that no longer exists, right. was tremendously important in the 1940s and then for most of U.S. history. Um, and um, uh, that, that position uh, later became, in essence, Secretary of Defense, what we call Secretary of Defense, which oversees the entire military establishment in the United States. Um, uh, but so FDR was giving a Republican a very important spot mm -hmm. in the in his cabinet and in the executive branch. Um, uh, he also and so Henry Stimson had been the um, Secretary of State under FDR's Republican predecessor Herbert Hoover. So this mm -hmm. was just not not just a nobody, a, a no name flunky. This is a Republican who had tremendous respect in the United States. In fact, he was very close to the Republican president, Theodore Roosevelt, and he also uh, served as Secretary of War. 30 years before he became it under FDR, he served as Secretary of War under uh, President Taft, also a Republican. So this was a, a very capable man yes. um, um, with many decades as a Wall Street lawyer mm -hmm. um, in between his service in the government. Um, but he was a very prominent Republican. Um, the other uh, chief appointment in this bipartisan alliance was uh, Frank Knox, who uh, also was a supporter of Republican President Theodore Roosevelt. Um, and had, he had been a newspaper reporter. Uh, and most significantly, he was the Republican Party's vice presidential nominee in 1936. So just four years before Franklin Roosevelt appointed him uh, to be the Secretary of Navy, he had been going around the country savagely attacking Franklin Roosevelt. He sure. was a bitter opponent of the New Deal. He thought, um, as, as many Republicans did, they thought that FDR was ruining the economy and um, a socialist, he created this program that gave everybody retirement checks. That's called Social oh, Security. I know. Wow, amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Radical, huh? He right. Who would think? <laughs> right. He extended um, the rights of, of workers to form labor unions, which ha it was an, 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 an epic struggle in U.S. society. Um, and he was basically accused of being a socialist, a Marxist, you name it, the, the, the Republican hatred for FDR was extreme. And Frank Knox was one of its chief uh, acolytes of that campaign against FDR. Right. So um, for FDR in 1940 to turn to Frank Knox and Henry Stimson, both of whom had re repeatedly criticized him publicly, that's a sign that FDR was ready to make a bold move to achieve um, unity in the United States mm -hmm. and to defend democracy and American democracy from the rise of fascism. That's what forced him, led him to do that. Um, and the reason there is that the Republican uh, Party and the Democratic Party were both split. There were isolationists in both parties who didn't want to do anything uh, or wanted the government to do very little to prepare for the oncoming war with Hitler, um, whereas FDR um, uh, and some members of both parties um, wanted to take actions to prepare the nation and mm -hmm. to defend the nation against uh, fascism. And um, so by bringing the Republicans into his cabinet, FDR was saying, our nation needs to rally behind this defense of democracy. Right. And um, I want all those Republicans who believe in defending democracy to come over and, and join me in that. In effort. defending. Yeah. And um, the, Re the Republicans at the time, the Republican Party was infuriated. This is June in 1940 when he appointed, made the appointment. And the Republicans were infuriated um, and they um, tried to throw Stimson and Knox out of the party. They said they don't speak for the party. They're only doing it for themselves. Um, they were, some called them traitors to the party. Sure. Um, 
And um, others said, this is not an alliance of the Republican Party with FDR. It's just these two guys. Let them do what they want. Mm -hmm. But it, it caused a huge uproar. Um, but the public, and polling showed this at the time, the public embraced this. They, they recognized that it, it was time to bring the country to prepare to defend it, to right. defend democracy and to try to make these two parties work together. And uh, so this move was broadly praised by the public. Yeah, I think that that's where they would pro... I'm going to speak on their behalf of the two Republicans that came on to the Democratic side of the president of FDR to say, you know, if not us, then who? Okay, so if... If we don't say, okay, let's try this, let's do this, you know, this is something my dad taught me a long time ago. I was nervous about running a team and all these different things. And I said, dad, he said, Aaron, I said, yeah. He's like, well, if not you, then who? And I was like, well, I guess that just kind of settles it right there. So I bet these guys were like, we need to step up to the plate for the country, for the red, white, and blue flag that we all uh, sleep under every single night. And come to an agreement to say, we're gonna to have to talk to each other and figure out our differences from the executive, legislative, you know, all the branches of, of government to win against fascism or else we'd be speaking another language right now. Exactly right, exactly right. I mean, it was, um, uh, and, and a lot of decision making or a lot of uh, discussion um, went into this, um, chiefly between Knox uh, and sure. FDR about the strategy, about how to do it and when to do it and who should be in the cabinet. Um, uh, and, and I detail a lot of that in the book, um, uh, how, they, how this all played out um, and the public reaction um, is, is, in my mind, an amazing story about American history. And of course, mind you that this happened in June of 1940 so um, the attack on Pearl Harbor uh, wouldn't happen for another 17 months mm -hmm. or 18 months. So um, uh, that was that attack really ended the debate over isolationism and brought America into the war. Uh, of course, um, FDR delivered his, you know, yesterday is a date of infamy Correct. speech uh, or J January 7 is date of infamy will live forever. Um, but um, uh, the, the actual um, joining of the Republicans with FDR began long before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, so it, it was not an easy decision. It's, it, you know, the parties were still very divided. The, the country mm -hmm. was very divided. Um, and um, uh, so... Uh, this was an, a very clear decision to build an alliance with the Democratic president long before the country was at war. So, you know, when an actual war begins, it's kind of natural for the parties to pull together, right? Everybody, you know, we're, we've been attacked. Let's defend ourselves. We'll put our disputes aside. Well, this was long before that. And um, they had to make a decision um, to throw off their party allegiance uh, although they still contended, by the way, that they were Republicans. They said right. they were Republicans. They were, in fact, Republicans. And many of them went on to very um, uh, important careers as Republican figures. But they said, we're going to join with a Democratic president. And it, it goes beyond Stimson um, and FDR. There were other significant Republicans. Um, uh, for example, um, w Wendell Wilkie. Um, who was the Republican candidate for president in 1940, um, built an alliance with FDR later in 1941. Um, and um, um, others, others who joined FDR include William Donovan, who became, who, whom FDR made the head of the OSS, the first spy agency, the precursor of the CIA. He was a prominent Republican before he joined with FDR. So there, there was a, it was a broad movement uh, to, to yeah, support how, this, this effort. How does this, um, how can we, you know, we're in this position again almost, right? We have something going on in Europe. 
Uh, it's, uh, you know, bubbling up over there uh, with Ukraine and, uh, you know, being trying to be taken over by Russia. Um, and Europe is kind of threatened with its eastern lines. <coughs> America's watching very closely for our allies that are, you know, making sure that they're, you know, taken care of as well. Um, we should be crossing the lines of um, the aisle right now, prepping ourselves for a future together uh, in bipartisan factor, right? So, I mean, we should be, you know, reaching across the aisle and saying, hey, we shouldn't be against each other. Let's realize the big picture here. Again, the goal, right, is unification so that we're strong together, not divided against each other. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's like, oh, is this war needed or not needed? We have 50-50 split in America. We have to be all together. <laughs> if we're going to send our sons and daughters off to war. Yeah, I, I agree completely. It's a, it's a, it's a shockingly um, similar situation where you mm -hmm. have a, um, a, a fascist Authoritarian dictator? Leader. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to yeah. say, yeah. <laughs> who's, who's, you know, running over neighboring nations, killing indiscriminately, um, killing civilians, airliners out of the sky, mayhem, yep. mm -hmm. and and, and um, democratic countries fearing this and and yes. trying to react. Um, so I, I agree, we are in need of of a common front, and so far um, we've managed to do that. Um, there was forty billion dollars in aid approved in May of this year, right. um, but President Trump has. Uh, spoken against it um, and criticized it and um, other Republicans have well as well right. uh, but so far the bipartisan support has been there to get these measures through Congress um, I do wonder how long that's going to last a new Republican majority in the House might put an end to funding for aid to Ukraine um, Boy, so yeah, we'll but, see how but we, that plays out. What we're seeing here, though, is um, it's kind of stirring up. You know, the moms are yelling at Russian officials in Russia. Like the moms are like, "You're taking our boys, and they're burning in tanks." I just saw some type of snippet from you know some outlet today where um, you know the mothers are yelling at the recruiters trying to get the boys to go to war, and they're like, "You're just burning them in the tanks. You're just killing our kids and burning them in the tanks." It's just a coffin, you know? And I was just like, I thought that was kind of moving, you know, when mom gets mad, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. what are you doing? Well, it's, you know, it, you know one would hope, I mean, that's, you know, that's why we um, in America love our democracy and our constitution. Yes. Because we have the freedom to object and uh, to any stupid wars our leaders may drag us into. Right. Right. Um, Putin has basically crushed that dissent. Mm -hmm. And there are a few brave people speaking out in Russia now. But by and large, um, objective reporting by news organizations on the war is completely crushed Correct. under Putin's fascism. And, um, you know, I, I hope that those mothers um, have an effect on the, the direction of the, the Russian war effort. But there's not much that can dissuade no. Vladimir Putin from the path that he chooses. And he is choosing his path. And yeah. whether he's ill, as people are speculating, or he is mentally ill, which we all speculate, uh, you know, he's, uh, it feels like he's, a, he's the kind of guy that would be backed in a corner uh, as a shark. And you can't back a shark in a corner. I think I heard of that as an analogy. And the shark has to keep going straight. <laughs> so he's going to keep trying to keep going straight somehow. But right now... Uh, you know, I would like to see us as a nation come together in those branches that exist that we all get to go and vote for and have say in as American people. I would, I would like to see that happen and get along. I would like to see them, you know, really, truly agreeing to see the support aid go to these, uh, this country, Ukraine needing it, not a fight about it. You know, like, oh, this doesn't make any sense. It does make sense. And I mean, if that's where my taxpayers' dollars are going, okay. <laughs> you know, I guess at least I know where they're going, you know, and, and another thing I want to point out, you know, it, is, is conscripting people is not patriotism. Forcing people to believe in something is not patriotism. Volunteering is patriotism. 
If you're going to join the military on your own accord and raise your hand to go do that, you're choosing to do so. That's like a, I want to do it. I'm motivated to do it. I'm going to be that patriotic, patri patriotic person. Mm. But if you bring back this like instituted two mandatory years or like a Korean, you have to go war or you have to fight or you're going to be drafted no matter what, like Vietnam, there was a lot of problems in Vietnam because people were drafted. They didn't want to go fight that war, right? We had protesters yeah. in ranks, but in World War II, we didn't really have any protesters in ranks because yeah. they all stepped up. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned um, conscription, but let's come back to that. But I, I would sure. say that um, on the subject of wanting our leaders to come together and, and um, have a discussion and, and reach agreement, um, of course, that's, that's, that's often very difficult to do, right? right. But what, one thing that made it possible for Franklin Roosevelt and Henry Stimson and Frank Knox and the other Republicans who joined with him to reach agreement is that um, they had a shared reverence for democracy and constitutional mm -hmm. democracy. And they worked from that shared goal. And, and um, that was sort of the, the basis and foundation that enabled them to come together. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, I'm not sure that everyone in America at this time actually supports constitutional democracy. You know, sure. we hear a lot of people talking about overthrowing an election um, that... Taking away women's might, rights. <laughs> yeah. You well, know? <laughs> uh, at, at least the election is... is um, uh, a constitutional... <laughs> a key element of the U.S. Constitution okay, from sure. its very foundation. <laughs> Sorry, I got some daughters, okay? I got from daughters, let me just be clear. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. I understand the importance of women's rights, and I agree with that. But I, I, my point is that there's nothing really more fundamental to American democracy than a presidential election. Right. And if, if millions of Americans are talking about overthrowing an election, I think we're in a, in a very disconcerting space in America Interesting. right now. Yeah. And I'm not sure but that everyone can come together and agree on democracy. That would be nice. I wish they would, but it's, it's not so clear that they will. Many of them seem to want a strong man in power. Um, well, and it seems like that strong man someone... preaches democracy to them, and that's what they think is the word democracy. It's like, if you pick me, democracy. And then someone else is like, if you pick me, democracy. So democracy just got muddied because one side's saying this and the other side's saying that. So what side am I supposed to fall? I don't really falter maybe my neighbor, okay? Because we, we move through this life and see the things, the newspapers and those things that, that penetrate our, you know, our, our thoughts. So one might think that is democracy to them. They might have been educated to be mm. thinking such. And so I would like to just maybe educate and just say democracy is the right to choose an elected president. The right to vote uh, and have that you know, free and fair elections where you can go stand in line and literally vote for who you want. Like, you know, like what you're talking about, not, uh, I don't know what someone might think democracy means. I don't want to skew it. I just want to talk about how it is and what it is from my definition, which is, you know, where we live, really. I know a lot of people come at me in this industry and say, oh, we live in a republic. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I feel you, okay, I get you, but, <laughs> you know, and, and someone might say, oh, I'm left-leaning or I'm right-leaning or they may not know anything about me personally as the host and I would just say, I'm, I bleed red blood. That's what I'll tell you right now. So don't label me. Mm -hmm. I don't really go after mm -hmm. labels. So if you want to go label them as a libertarian or you want to go label them as a Republican or whatever, you're just labeling things. If you can just say, we're neighbors and hey, um, we need to dig this ditch together so we can put the fence in, then that's kind of how I, I, I move through life. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like help yeah. your neighbor. That fence needs to be put in. <laughs> yeah. Well, I agree with you about the, the use of the word um, uh, democracy by both sides. It, it's sort of carried um, by both sides. And, and this is where um, we often run into, okay, well, who's got right on their side? Mm -hmm. is, um, is it possible that, that democracy 
um, that democracy was subverted here and that there was massive fraud and that the wrong man won the election um, mm -hmm. or was designated the winner. Um, and, and I think that our system, as agreed upon um, uh, by most Americans, um, rests on a system of laws and courts. And if you're going to make that claim, then you need to prove it before a judge and possibly mm -hmm. a jury. And, and then, then we can act. If it's so entirely uh, disputed, let's bring it in a court and see where, let the chips fall where they may. And in fact, more than 60 lawsuits were brought by Trump's, President Trump's supporters. And um, they lost in every case. They never proved any fraud. No. And to my mind, that is, um, that is determinant. That is um, 60 cases. The it, issue. And we all lived through it. We all watched it, and it went down that way. There was, it was on all the outlets, you know, 60 cases. You're correct. And, you know, let me bring it back to the Al Gore, uh, George Bush hanging Chad fiasco, okay? Because I was in Florida on the deciding day of the hanging Chad, and then I flew to L.A. that same very, no, I flew to George W., I flew to Texas Airport, George Bush Airport. And everybody's like, oh, Bush is going to win. It's going to be Bush. And I was like, wow, I'm in like central Bush zone right now in his dad's airport in Texas, <laughs> and it's the hanging Chad decision day. And then I'm flying to L.A. right away. So I fly to L.A., and as soon as I land in L.A., it's like Al Gore is going to win. It was just complete, you know, just craziness and at the end of the day we all know the deciding factor was somebody didn't punch the hanging chad all the way through and it bulbist and it doesn't count for gore and you know this perforated hanging chad hung just on it still and that goes to george bush you know and and, and that was really kind of like getting into the courts to try to decide who's going to be the president with the hanging chad throw these votes out throw keep these votes in like okay who's to say right and that's where we came out with now with electronic touchpad stuff so the hanging mm -hmm. chads aren't going to be the problem because we were voting by punching that right. system you take your voting card put it in the machine and you punch all or you go through each one so yeah. today we have people now selling those voting machines on ebay and auction sites because they took it from a michigan voting booth and tried to break into it and didn't know what to do so they gave it away to goodwill goodwill said, oh, we have this like big, huge flat screen TV thing with an insert for a card. Let's just sell it on Goodwill's websites. They sold it for $7. And it just so happened the person that bought it was a collector of voting registration equipment who was also the person in charge of the votes that just happened recently. And so not only is he like in charge of the voting for the Fed, he's also a collector. So here he bought it immediately. He's, and then he called the FBI and said, we just got... Look what I just got delivered to me. This thing from Michigan, it's a whole voting system. And it shouldn't, it's still active. So you have people out there trying to do so many different things to these things to try to, you know, uh, screw us over as American people with our elections, okay? Whether they're, they're bad actors. They're just trying to game the system or figure it out, right? So I don't know. I think that uh, you're, you're right. Do people want their democracy or democracy what's going on here because yeah. i never ever thought people would be taking voting equipment and like trying to hack it and like crack into it to but hey that's not my game i'm not after mm -hmm. that so mm -hmm. you know there's always bad apples <laughs> yeah yeah but back to the issue of conscription yeah um i i can tell you that interestingly enough uh, um uh, I, I, that in 19, in August of 1940, um, uh, a, the um, uh, Henry Stimson and, and uh, Frank Knox um, worked with FDR to actually pass a conscription bill in Congress. Oh. Um, and that was one of the first actions that they, they dove into to help FDR achieve his program to prepare the country for World War II. And as a result of that, um, some 16 million Americans were expected to register. Um, 
and um, 400,000 were drafted and, and, into, and brought into the service um, within months. So uh, the, the preparations for the war um, were moving fast. Um, but um, there were not a, a lot of objections to that. Well, there, well actually, let, me, let me retract that. There, were, there was a lot of opposition in Congress, and, and Stimson and Knox helped FDR overcome that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but ultimately, um, conscription during World War II was much more widely accepted than it was, say, during Vietnam. Um, but um, uh, that was part of uh, the program that the two Republicans helped the Democratic president put in place to prepare the country for war. So what you just are teaching me right now, today I learned that there was the draft of World War II soldiers, right? That's what you're telling me, is that they drafted soldiers yes, into right. the war. Okay, but they were just accepting of it because they understood the need to go, to go per se. Some people were probably pushing back on Vietnam, not understanding why Vietnam was having to be fought and conscripted in that aspect, right? That would be kind of like the scales here right. um, of what I'm just learning. So I can't know everything. So I'm just trying to, you know, I figured World War II, I've seen Captain America. He's like, take me 15 different ways. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> right? <laughs> You're not getting in, kid. Right. Yes, I am, you know, but there was, you know, a collective draft to bring troops in to build up our numbers. Okay. Well, there was, you know, um, huge resentment in America um, over World War I. Uh -huh. And um, uh, more than 100,000 Americans had died in World War I. And um, there, was a, there was a great deal of discontent over belief that um, the arms manufacturers and the banks um, had profited tremendously from World War I. Um, uh, so uh, that resulted in, in um, uh, that supported the isolationist movement that said, we don't want to have anything to do with any more wars. Um, and uh, so there was a tremendous opposition to preparing the country for war or building up an army there was no standing army or very excuse me a very small standing army um the united states army was ranked 19th in the nation in the world excuse me mm -hmm. in 1939 um, it was it was tiny uh, ranked near portugal um, so um that was what um stimson believed needed to be corrected was that the United States need to be prepared for war with Hitler's war machine. So I just want offering that because there is there is a different side of conscription. The yeah. question is, what are you being conscripted for? Does it right. make sense? Is it reasonable right. in, in the context and in the situation that we have in the world? Um, so I, I think it's a very different time, um, say, from Vietnam. Th there's yeah. a reason why they called World War II the good war. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and to conscript, a fine point on conscript. you know, I, I guess my dad, uh, being, uh, 17 in Vietnam, he joined the Navy versus getting drafted. You know, he kind of chose to go. So his choice, right? He's like, I'll make the path. If you're going to make me go, I'm going to choose the Navy. <laughs> you know, he's like, I'm going to go that route. So, I mean, you know, that choice was his to make and it led him into a Green Beret career. And, uh, you know, I'm glad my father's who he was, but. Um, my grandfather also fought in World War II in the Navy, and uh, he chose to fight in the Navy. Um, so, Leonard, thank you for doing that, Grandpa. And, uh, you know, uh, boy, I just talked to a bomber pilot. See, I get this cool job to talk to you and other guys, right? And uh, this bomber pilot, he's still alive. He's 100, going on 101, 25 missions over, wow. over France and Europe. Man. I mean, like, you know, he's like, we're just waiting for the big B. I was like, what's that? You know, he's like, Berlin. I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, and that's on another episode. So if you want to go back and listen, but real quick, I just want to talk about the definition kind of of conscript, right? Maybe my listener doesn't know uh, what a conscript is and maybe you can correct me. I'm going to say that a conscript is a male aged uh, body of like 17, 16, 17, who's going to be pulled into a forced military of that country, correct? Yes, you're obligated by law to to report for military duty to register right. and make yourself 
available for training and military service um, if notified by the government. Like 100%. Like, script. yep, and that's, and that's almost like in Vietnam, they had a lottery system where they would, like your last name meant something and then there was a number and your location and, you know, they had these, this lottery system and you're like, do I have the lottery? Am I going to go register today? Um, you know, you can go register on your own right now. You know, those of you out there that have any, uh, you know, uh, desire or are wanting to be inspired, I know that, you know, the Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marines are looking for the few, the proud, the brave, those that want to go into the wild blue yonder, uh, those that want to be backpacking Army, and, uh, you know, the Navy. We need you, Navy. So I would say that, you know, thank you to those of you who have joined and that are listening to this podcast and saying, I want to do this when Rad's retired. <laughs> I'm going to take over Rad's job. But by all means, you know, it's like, honestly, I think you get my vibe here uh, is I just want to have a, a really cool, like, you know, chill world where we can travel around and visit each other and, you know, have a nice sense of security from one border to another. Um, that's really what I'd like to see. Now, we have to be prepared. Okay, I get it. I get it. There has to be guys that work in the shadows at night. I understand. All right. But... Let them do that. <laughs> um, well, there, there are always those people who, who uh, you know, yes, uh, taking, defending democracy, um, defending the freedoms that all of us enjoy um, requires hard work. It does. And, and we should be grateful to those who do it. And um, so uh, well, that's in part... Um, what I'm thinking about when I write this book is that I, I, I will say that I was unable to um, go into a lot of the military history. Um, my book is more on political leadership and sure. leadership at the top. But uh, there's so many incredible works of history about the battles and the military strategy. Um, I don't have a lot of that, but those stories are incredible and um, worth reading about. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Any type of history lesson, I'm all for it. That's why I, I love learning and I'm always open to asking questions, falling on my face and picking myself back up after I learn the right answer. It's totally fine. You know, that's how we learn. If you don't fail, you don't succeed. Okay. Those two words, they got to go together. There's no last place if there's no first place. Okay. So I don't know what else to tell you. Um, except to go buy your book. Okay. Let me plug your book. Okay. And uh, let me, let me, let me say it. Let me say it. Hold on one second. I have it right here. So it's Uniting America, how FDR and Henry Stimson brought Democrats and Republicans together to win World War II by this guy right here. Peter Schinkel wrote that, all right? And he put a lot of his time and heart into it. And I want to thank, um, uh, is it Sophia who hooked this all up and said, hey, Rad, let's get Peter on your show. And Sophia, thank you if you listen to this, okay? I want to say thank you for all the back and forth with myself and uh, Peter. So thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, well, um, listen. You know, uh, yes, I, please tell me, tell me, about, please. I could, well, I was going to say, um, you know, uh, one point you were interested in bipartisanship, and I can tell you that um, it is interesting to know that, that you know bipartisanship doesn't always produce the greatest outcome. There can be bipartisanship that produces a bad outcome. Um, so. Uh, for example, um, uh, Republicans and Democrats agreed for many years um, on segregation of black and white right. people in the United States. Right. So um, the point to be made is that, that bipartisanship is only as good as the goals that it seeks to, to carry out. And... Um, Another example from the World War II era is that Democrats and Republicans supported um, putting Japanese Americans into internment concentration camps. Yeah. More than 100,000 of them. Right here in so, Utah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Topaz so Mountain. I, I, yeah, it's talking, true. It, yeah. I, I Just, investigate and, and talk about how FDR and Henry Stimson made their way to that decision and the unwinding of the decision 
and the stain that it left on both their bipartisan alliance and on American democracy. Um, but the point, the broader point is that, that democ uh, bipartisanship is only as good as the goal um, that it is seeking. And um, if that goal is in greater democracy and greater freedom for our citizens and for people around the world, then that goal is good. But when it envisions negative goals and pursues negative goals, it can have a very bad outcome. So That's bipartisanship correct. is not always perfect. It's bipartisanship in support of what cause. That's what we need to ask. That goalpost. That's what we're. That that's the goal. Like, what's the goal to get that bipartisanship done? Okay, I completely agree with you. And I, when I say I guess bipartisan and reaching across the aisle, I mean for the right reasons in the right ways for the right goals. I hundred percent mean that. You know. And so, one thing that uh, I, you know, as we wind down our show here, is uh, I think of George Takai. Okay, live long and prosper from Star Trek, right? Uh, Japanese, uh, as a young man, was put into an internment camp, right? He, his right. family, during yeah. World War II, they uh, segregated him. Um, today, you can see him on Instagram, and he's constantly chatting up everybody. And, and I just want to give a shout out to George Takai right there, World War II <laughs> veteran right there of that whole. Uh, and living in Utah, I had no idea the significance of all of the different internment camps that were put here. I had no idea until just like a year ago. And I knew about Topaz Mountain, right? I knew about that, but I didn't know about the place up in Ogden. I didn't know about the Clearfield Freeport Center. That was a whole military industrial complex that's now running like lifetime basketballs out of it. And they were used to house all of World War II uh, immigrants coming in from the war. And I was just like, I'm blown away by you know, how everything surrounding us here in Utah is really ran by the military industrial machine. I'm just saying, Hill Air Force Base builds its cities around it for the World War II dropping of the atomic bomb on, uh, or the nuclear, the, yeah, atomic on uh, Hiroshima because they did the Doolittle Raid out of Utah. The whole Doolittle Raid was sent out of Windover, and Windover is right here on the border in Utah of Nevada, and then Hill Air Force Base was built so that it could get to Windover. It was just like this whole mechanism of World War II. Utah is really just a military industrial complex foundation that now the city rises from, from World War II. It's crazy. Right. Well, so, the past is always with us. <laughs> and we should learn from it and, uh, you know, and, and, and study it. So thank you for the history lesson today. And I want others to buy your book and check it out where fine books are sold. I know it's going to be dropping in October. So we're super excited. Uh, thanks for getting me a copy of it and letting me learn about what you've written. And it's been a super pleasure to have you on the, on the, on the podcast on Soft Rep Radio. And if you have any final words, I'll let you have something to say. Well, Red, it's been a pleasure being here. Thank you so much for having me. And um, I really appreciate your questions and the conversation today. And, um, you know, the only words that I can offer is that um, I hope that our country can continue to find its way to have uh, thoughtful debates and um, find a way to support democracy and constitutional democracy in our country and around the world. And I think if we can do that, we're on the right path. I love it. That's a great message. And we're just going to... We're going to say thank you for being on the show. I'm going to say live long and prosper. And thanks for listening to Soft Rep Radio. It's been a pleasure, Peter. Thank you. Thank you.